Thank you for coming this evening to the, uh, the final part of our uh, day of the uh, Kansas Languages Symposium. My name is Vincent Miller, and I'm the uh, director of the uh, Educational Technology Center here at Johnson County <coughs> Community College. And let me ask how many of you speak German or understand German? A couple. Okay. I thought maybe if everybody did, I'd have uh, Professor Keel do his talk in German. You're happy we, to. We won't do that. <laughs> um, what does this gentleman back here speak? English. <laughs> English. All right. Very good. It's the official state language. That's great. <laughs> um, Professor Keel has been uh, at the University of Kansas since 1978 in the uh, Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures, and he was the chair of the department from uh, 1990 to 2011. And um, his teaching and research interests are in German dialectology, Germanic philology, the structure of modern German and German-American studies, and he's an expert in German settlement dialects, also called Sprachinseln in German. Very good. And he directs the uh, linguistic atlas of um, Kansas German dialects. And if you get a chance, go out and look at their website. He brought up a, a slide of that earlier today. It's got some really good information. Interesting to go out and listen to some of the MP3 audio files and hear some of the speakers that they've recorded in, in Kansas. Um, for many years, he uh, has led the KU Advanced Summer Language Institute in Holzkirchen, Germany, which is in southern Bavaria. We have former, an alum Former here. student. Thank you. And um, so Professor Keel uh, was known at KU among the students as being somebody who was really hospitable, really dedicated to the culture. He even hosted parties at his house, and so I think he contributed a lot to the, uh, the German department there at KU. Um, I appreciate those of you who have, have been here throughout the day, so thank you for, for attending the symposium. And uh, my honor to uh, have uh, Dr. Keel here to give the talk on the crazy quilt of languages in Kansas. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Vince. Uh, Vince was one of my best students. Uh, uh, he surpassed uh, doctoral and master's candidates as an undergraduate senior. And uh, I'll never forget that experience in history of the German language. When, what year was that? 80 something? 87. Oh, good Lord. Well, uh, we're not here to dwell on the past, uh, although I will be talking about the past. <clears throat> uh, those of you who've been here all day long uh, know that Hector and uh, Ed Smith, and where is Merved? Uh, there she is, come, entering at, just as I speak. Let's all give her a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, we've had a, a very interesting time exploring uh, four of the groups of uh, language speakers in Kansas, uh, German, uh, Osage, uh, Spanish, and Arabic. Uh, but uh, I was asked to talk tonight, I guess, about everything else. Is that right? <laughs> Which is a, uh, as we would say in German, a, a wide field or ein weites Feld. Uh, an impossible task. Uh, luckily, we have at the University of Kansas uh, in the library search site, ScholarWorks, a, uh, some over 3,000 page document by a former French professor, uh, Justice Neil Carmen. And I invite you, if you are at all interested in non-English speaking groups in Kansas to Look at that. Uh, he has a volume with uh, atlases of every county uh, indicating where there were non-English speaking settlements. He has a second volume detailing the settlement histories of all those non-English speaking settlements. And in the final volume, he uh, explores the origins of these uh, settlers. So it is a fascinating study. And some of what I'll be showing you tonight is based on that. Uh, the other uh, items are typically drawn from the uh, more recent uh, census information and the American Community Survey that the Census Bureau also undertakes. Why did I call it a crazy quilt? Well, what's a crazy quilt, Jim? Uh, a quilt that's better than the same asylum. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> How do you make a quilt? Out of, pieces. Out of pieces. And if it's a crazy quilt, what are those pieces like? They don't match. 
They're, they're all, they're from, they're different colors, uh, they're different sizes, but you sew them together to create a quilt. Did you know that, Vince? I didn't know that. Did you? Well, okay, that concludes my talk. I was just here to talk about how to make a crazy quilt. And when I look at Kansas, uh, what, what do you see when you drive through Kansas? I see uh, patches of ethnic settlements all over the state. Uh, some are highlighted by the churches that these ethnic groups built. Uh, in some places you can find ethnic foods that are reminiscent of those uh, settlers in their early times. And in some places like Garden City, you can still see them living their daily life, going about their business, working, uh, going to church, etc., in their immigrant language. Uh, there still are people around the state from the earlier period that speak languages other than English, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. Uh, so I'm going to be looking first at Kansas today in the, where are we? In the, we're now in the second decade of the 21st century, uh, but the data is largely from the first decade, but it's essentially correct. I wanted to start out with, let's see if this is the right way to go. Nope. How about that? Okay. Uh, this is kind of the jumping off place. How many knew that since 2007, English is statutorily the official language of our state? Ed, uh, Hector did. Are you the only one? You guys did, okay. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I didn't know that there are currently 31 states in our beloved union that have created such statutes. Now, the Kansas statute is relatively long with all kinds of paragraphs and so forth. In other states, it just says English shall be the official language, period. And you don't know what else is going to happen. But uh, that's the starting point. However, as soon as you take a look at the 2000 census data, or for that matter, the community, American Community Survey, uh, that's done every so many years. I, I think now they're up to about 2011, I, I believe. Uh, you see a very different picture. And I title this slide, What's the Matter with Kansas? Uh, I don't know, that might be a reference to some book that somebody wrote once. Or, but in any event. Uh, and you can see that there's some 260,000 Kansans who claim to speak a language other than English on a regular basis in the home. That means persons five years of age and older. Don't worry about the little kids, okay. Uh, 170 of those people say they speak Spanish. And I'll let Hector decide what kind of Spanish it is, but in any event, we've got that. We were talking today at who's in second place. Well, apparently the Germans are there. And we talked today about all the different varieties of German in Kansas, and they come in with about 14,000. Nearly 10,000 people speak Vietnamese in Kansas, and I can testify to the students that we get at KU from Wichita or Garden City uh, who come in to be tested so they can be exempted from the foreign language requirement because they speak Vietnamese. Uh, close behind are Chinese. We, we were just looking at, uh, I'll show you in a map in a second, that. Uh, Chinese is pretty well represented in, I believe, three counties in Kansas as the third most prevalent language after English and Spanish. Okay, see that in a second. French, around 5,000. Laotian, 4,500. About 3,500 speak Arabic, and Merved can testify to that. Close to that is Korean. Then we have several that are in the 2,500 range, like Hindi, Russian, Tagalog from the Philippines, Swahili. We were talking about Swahili, uh, Somalia, for instance. Uh, 1,500 Urdu, Gujarati, both from the Indian Peninsula. Persian, which would be Farsi or from Iran. Uh, Japanese, Hmong from Laos, probably, or Vietnam. Thai, Italian, Portuguese and Telugu, also a language from the Indian uh, subcontinent. And there's over 80 other different languages represented in this survey in Kansas, ranging in number from just a handful uh, up to these larger groups. So uh, my response is, <laughs> 
Kansas may have an official language of English, uh, but we still have a multilingual society in Kansas, and it's not going to go away tomorrow, okay? Uh, I think uh, some of the other uh, panelists uh, brought up some of these statistics. Uh, we have foreign born in Kansas who hail from a number of regions in the world. Uh, for instance, uh, Africa, over 8,000. Uh, Asia, close to 50,000. Uh, Oceania would be islands in the Pacific, uh, about 1,000 people. Latin America tops them all with over 100,000. Uh, and Kansas claim interesting ancestries. Now, I brought this up because, of, no. German is number one, but it may be overtaken eventually. Uh, Irish comes in second place, followed by English, French, Swedish. I'll talk a little bit about Swedish in Kansas in a, in a couple of minutes. Italian, the sub-Saharan group, uh, close to uh, 16,000. And Arabs, as opposed to Arabic speakers, close to 8,000. Okay? So uh, Kansas is a multi-ethnic society, a multilingual society. I think that's, that is the present day situation. And, and you've seen these maps. Uh, they've been used on the uh, advertisements and the posters downstairs, uh, but they tell us quite a bit. Uh, look at those statistics. Uh, the, the darkest uh, color, which is, let's see, did I press this one? Yeah. Uh, actually, maybe I can use this. It'll be easier for me. Uh, looks like we do not have any counties with 50 to 92 percent not speaking English, but Finney, Ford, Seward, in uh, southwestern Kansas, and I, I believe uh, you mentioned today that Finney County was close to 50% Spanish, right? Uh, so, uh, and you add to that the Vietnamese, Swahili, uh, Mennonite Low German, what have you, and you readily get to a situation where English is indeed the minority language, okay? But you can see that these southwestern counties uh, dominated by meatpacking, uh, Tyson Foods has just drawn immigrants in in the last 20, 30 years to that part of Kansas. It is, I don't know if it's going to be a melting pot, but it's certainly a boiling pot uh, of languages right now. Now this shows you that Spanish is going to be the dominant language in that part of the state. Where's my curse? There we go. Uh, the darkest counties, look at this. Uh, of those people who do not speak English, the overwhelming majority are Spanish speakers, and that's indicated by the colors on this map. This is a different map. It's talking about what language is spoken at home by persons five years of age and older, based on the 2000 census. Uh, Spanish dominates. God bless them, the Germans are now well represented. Uh, down here, Marion County, McPherson County. These have to be Mennonites uh, from Russia. Uh, up here, uh, that's um, Washington County, uh, Hanover, those are also uh, Germans and the neighboring county here. Uh, this conglomeration out in west central Kansas is largely the, the Volga German group that is still present linguistically, even if, if the population is aging. Uh, and I like this. Who would have thunk? Rollins County. Uh, with uh, the home of Mike Hayden, our former governor, uh, is making the German list. Uh, and guess what? How many of you knew that one county in Kansas had Czech as its third most prevalent, excuse me, a second language after English? Who knew that? All right. That's why you should always look at your census data as soon as it's available. Now, this is a little bit nicer map for German. This is the prevalent language spoken in the home after English and Spanish. And now Kansas is looking a lot more German. Uh, and there's some other languages popping up. And when I say prevalent, it doesn't mean there's thousands of speakers necessarily, but at least they're in third place after English and Spanish. Now we've got a second county, Decatur County, with Czech. Uh, we've got several counties with Vietnamese. Uh, 
this would be Sedgwick County, this would be Ford, Finney County. So, so Finney County is very easily seen as Spanish and Vietnamese, largely. Uh, we've got some counties that boast a French population of speakers. Cloud County, we'll see a little bit later, was one of the early major French settlements in Kansas. Uh, Ed, where's your county? Jackson County. And uh, I believe both the Kickapoo and Potawatomi reservations are in Jackson County. I, I might be a little wrong on one, but Potawatomi is definitely there. Uh, and the second Fox are in that county as well. That's Native American. And good old Johnson County and Douglas, and down here where Pittsburgh State University is, our friends the Chinese are in third place. So uh, Kansas is pretty neat. Don't forget Laotian and what did we say that was? Cowley County, Ark City. Is that who? You're testifying to Ark City. I'm not testifying. Okay. Well, that's what I mean. See, that's already a crazy quilt, okay, of, of languages. All right, let's step back in history, and this ties in with what Ed was talking about this morning in regard to Osage. Uh, folks believe that this was what Kansas looked like linguistically prior to 1800. We can't go too far back in time, and as, as Ed pointed out, Indians were migrating to some extent. The Osage came in from the east. But prior to any, well, I don't want to mention Coronado, but uh, prior to 19th century white incursions, this is what Kansas looked like. And these uh, Native Americans represented about four different language families. We had a question this morning about uh, the history of the Native American languages and uh, how are they related, or are there divisions that occurred? Ed got into a little bit of that uh, regarding the Osage. Uh, but as you can see from this map, let's see, let's find Kansas. Kansas is right in here. And the yellow group is the uh, Cadawan family. Uh, this greenish group, uh, which uh, the Kansa and the Osage belong to, is the Siouan group, the Sioux language family. Uh, the uh, pink, where, I keep losing my cursor, there we go, is uh, the Arapaho belong to the Algonquin uh, family, which is related to other families up here around the Great Lakes and even over here in New England. Uh, and finally, this, what color is that, lilac? Or if that's the Tanoa, that would be the group that the Kiowa uh, people are connected with. And you can see that the Kansas... Native American languages uh, had to have an earlier history. Uh, for instance, the Cadawan group up here and down here probably at one time were a larger entity and unified. And perhaps the uh, Kiowa type group came up from the south and split that group. So there's a lot of prehistory out there that we can only uh, surmise or speculate on. Okay, that's the pre-19th century situation linguistically. But what happened in the 19th century? Well, uh, Ed was talking about the Trail of Tears this morning, uh, which didn't really affect Kansas per se. Uh, but in 1830, one of your favorite presidents from Tennessee, what was his name, Jim? Andrew Jackson, uh, well, actually the Congress, under Jackson's leadership, I guess we could say, passed the Indian Removal Act. And that meant that uh, the Indian nations from the eastern United States were forcibly removed to Indian territory, uh, which included at that time uh, the states of, well, the area that would now be Nebraska, Kansas, and later Oklahoma. And uh, maybe I'll try using this. OK, yeah, here you can see uh, where these eastern tribes are being relocated. Let's see, do I have it? Actually, isn't that the Osage? I thought they were 
Let's go to another map that, that will show you the situation in 1853. Yeah, that's better. Uh, this is the Osage uh, area. Uh, here's the Kaw. Uh, you might wonder why some of the squares have at first a larger area and then a smaller area. That's called diminishment. Uh, the, the Indian groupings were diminished over time and then eventually, with the exception of the Kickapoo and the Potawatomi, the Saxon Foxes, the uh, uh, I believe it's, you said it was the Otos or the Iowas uh, up here in the, that sort of, sort of bleeding over into Nebraska. They've all been removed from the state to allow for the settlement of whites. But at one time, between 1830 and the final removal of these groups, we had all of these different languages being spoken in what's Kansas. So, so we had a, a very interesting period of history uh, under unfortunate circumstances, but still it's part of our language history in Kansas. Now 1854 marks the big uh, division in uh, Kansas history. It's when the Kansas-Nebraska Act is finally uh, signed into law by Franklin Pierce, and uh, it opens up Kansas for settlement by, how do you decide on a name for these people? White Europeans or others, okay, other folks. Uh, by the 1890s, when all of the Kansas uh, counties were organized, uh, there were a large number of non-English speaking settlements. And these are all documented by uh, Carmen's uh, material that I mentioned earlier. Uh, over 300 German-speaking settlements. And those of you who are in the lecture this morning know that by saying German, we don't mean German as it's taught in the schools, but the way people spoke in their rural communities, their dialects, okay? 59 Swedish settlements with 31,000 speakers. 23 French settlements. Again, a fairly significant number of speakers. Czech, 23 settlements and a lot of smaller settlements, including Dutch, Flemish. Now, some people might quibble about the difference between Dutch and Flemish, but if you're from Belgium or the Netherlands, you think it's a big deal. Okay. Uh, Danish, Norwegian, Welsh, from Wales, Hungarian, Polish, Russian, Serbo-Croatian, Slovenian, Italian, Lithuanian, and yes, Merved, Arabic. Small numbers, but they were there. This is Carmen's index of foreign language settlements in Kansas. Uh, let, me, let me step out here so I can point better. Uh, in Pittsburgh and Wichita, he, he finds uh, Arabic, largely from Syria. But the Syrians were typically uh, what, from what we would now call Lebanon. All right. uh, there's our Czech settlements. There's a Croatian in Kansas City, uh, Danish, Dutch. Flemish, here's a, look at all these French communities. German is a very long list. Norwegian, Polish, Slovenians. Spanish comes in a little bit later, uh, after roughly 1900. Uh, Swedish and general Scandinavian, and finally Welsh. So uh, Carmen does a magnificent job of uh, finding these settlements, getting the statistics on their population and their development, and he also provides what he calls a critical year for each of these communities when the language stopped being passed on to the next generation. Uh, in the, some of the larger communities, such as the Volga Germans or the, the Czechs in uh, Wilson or Cuba, it's in the 1940s. Uh, in some of the others, they start losing the language relatively early, and by 1900, there's hardly anyone left uh, speaking the language. So it, it varies. And in some, the critical year has yet to be reached, and uh, folks are still speaking these languages. Here's a map from uh, showing the 1895 situation. You can see uh, where there were concentrations of non-English speakers. Uh, I just want to show you a couple of these maps just to give you a sort of a visual feel for this situation. 
He uses colored letters <laughs> to indicate the types of settlements. Uh, yellow is German, red is Swedish, blue is Czech, and black is French. These are the four major groups in the 19th century. This is a slightly different map using the same color scheme, yellow for German, uh, red basically for Swedish, other Scandinavian groups. Uh, blue is uh, Bohemian or Czech, and uh, French is black. He also has some Dutch and Welsh in here. But these show you where the groups had major land holdings. And again, this is back in this crazy quilt pattern. This really is a crazy quilt on, on this map. Now, I showed you this map this morning, but uh, just to not leave the Germans high and dry, uh, as the largest group settling in Kansas in the post-1854 period, uh, Kansans had, uh, Germans had settlements in almost every county. Uh, the major settlements, here's our, whoop, that was the wrong one. Uh, our Volga Germans out here in Hayes, Germans from Austria-Hungary, Bukovina Germans here, uh, the Mennonites from Russia largely, but also mixed in there, a lot of Pennsylvania Germans, uh, Catholics uh, from the Rhineland here in Sedgwick County, uh, Wabunsee County. Who goes to Wabunsee County to find Germans? Uh, but it, you may have gone to Alma and gone to the cheese uh, factory there. Th that whole Mill Creek Valley was settled by Germans. Uh, it's very German to this day. Uh, low Germans from northern Germany up here in Marshall and Nemaha counties. Uh, low German Catholic speakers in, uh, that's Nemaha County, sorry. Uh, in, and this is Marshall and Washington counties. Okay, that's, we've done that. Now let's talk a little bit about Swedish. Uh, after uh, German, the largest number of non-English speakers in the 19th century were the Swedes. They were also largely brought in uh, to settle along the railroad line, the Kansas Pacific, much as the uh, Germans were. And you can see the counties where they were settled. Who knows the preeminent Swedish town in Kansas? And not, Jim, not you or your wife. <laughs> Lensborg, yes. What county is Lensborg in? Well, I, I'll give you two guesses. It's either Saline or McPherson. It's in McPherson, okay. But you can see that the Swedish settlement uh, spills over the county line. Uh, let's go on to the next map. A lot of Swedish churches were also established in Kansas, just as there were German congregations and French congregations. Uh, they were largely the Augustana Lutheran group, or there were also a so-called Mission Covenant Church that was of Swedish origin. And there were other Swedish Baptist, Swedish Methodist churches that were uh, established in Kansas. Uh, I just, I made this map up uh, from a, a state highway map, just so you can, there's Lensborg, Cardinata Heights. It's kind of as if the uh, Swedish settlement follows the Smoky Hill River Valley, and Falun, Smolan, Asaria, those are all Swedish in origin. Uh, today, what's left of the Swedish, you said Sprachinsel, or linguistic enclave, not a whole lot, but what? what? What do they have once a year? They have a heritage festival, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the Swedish settlement uh, in Lensborg uh, dates already from the 1850s. Uh, once the railroads were being built after the Civil War, there was a more concentrated uh, settlement effort. Bethany College gets established there. Uh, it also has these two uh, church groups that represent the Swedish uh, language. Uh, I found this uh, statement interesting. In 1884, uh, for Bethany College, it said, uh, the Swedish and English languages shall be considered equally important. Okay, but Relatively soon, there was the transition uh, from Swedish to English in their church services with the last uh, Swedish services in the 1930s, maybe a few isolated cases up to the uh, uh, first, uh, Second World War. 
uh, here's a quote uh, from Carmen's work. In after 1900, Swedish retreated rapidly in the next 30 years. Speakers felt shame in using it. Now that's an interesting statement. We haven't had a war with Sweden. Uh, not to, Jim, help me out. Have we attacked Sweden? No, I don't think so. Uh, but it was probably a little spillover from the anti-German sentiment and just the anti-foreign sentiment in the World War I era uh, that affected all of these language groups. Um, then it goes on, shame disappeared about 1930 and the retreat of Swedish was slow. But by 1960, except among the very old, only occasional word of Swedish was uttered. Uh, however, and this is so typical of these groups, at the moment they realize they are losing their culture and their language, what do they do? They establish a heritage society and they start having a heritage festival and they have the uh, Hulningsfest every year since the 1940s in Lensborg. They have a website, you can go there and probably nobody speaks Swedish, all right? but they celebrate this ethnic cultural heritage. Uh, in 1895, uh, Carmen reports there were 900 Swedes in the town of Lindsborg. The census for 2000, and this may be just an estimate, uh, records 55 Swedish speakers uh, for the whole county, McPherson, Co McPherson County. I don't want to say McPherson, McPherson, okay. So you can see that we're getting to the stage where it's, even if there are a few speakers left, they're not gonna be there for long. The Czechs uh, are probably in a very similar situation. Uh, there were two major Czech settlements uh, up in Republic County, the so-called Cuba Czechs, and uh, in Ellsworth County, the Wilson Czechs. Everybody who's driven out inter Interstate 70, uh, go by the billboards for the Czech capital of, what do they call it? The, Czech capital of the world, or just Kansas? Okay, okay, we'll give them Kansas. Or the Polka capital of Kansas, or something like that. Uh, similar situation, Let's, uh, let me give you a map identity on them. Okay, there's Cuba, uh, Agenda, they settled basically in this area, in, uh, that's Republic County, that's, that's the one county where where Czech is still listed as the uh, second most prevalent language in, in Kansas after English. Uh, here's their brief history. Uh, beginning in the 1860s, there were numerous Czech families from settlements in Iowa. It's around Cedar Rapids, Iowa, for instance, there's still lots of Czech uh, uh, localities, uh, settlements. Also Wisconsin. And then some later came directly from Bohemia, which would be the western part of the Czech Republic today. Uh, they established New Tabor, named after the place Tabor in Bohemia. And then eventually their centers became Cuba and Munden. They had Czech churches. Uh, and they also had Czech gymnastic societies, so-called. Uh, I talked this morning about the German Turner societies. The Czechs had the same thing. They had gymnastics association where you had a sound mind and a sound body and a good beer, okay? Um, Czechs are also noted for their, their lager beer. How many have ever had a Pilsner beer? All right, Budweiser. That, those are Czech names that were stolen by Anheuser-Busch, okay. Um, Here's a quote from the 1940s. Excuse me, I left, uh, wanted to mention, by 1895, uh, estimated 1,500 checks in Cuba, in uh, uh, Republic County, and by the 1940s, most children no longer learning Czech, okay? Here's a quote from the late 1940s. The second generation are practically all Czech speaking, but with the third generation, this ties into what uh, Jim was saying this afternoon, there's a breaking away from the line, a Czech perhaps marrying an American. So now we have some Czechs in name only, speaking practically only English, while in other instances, the women with the English or other name may still be able to speak the Czech language, being of Czech descent. Now, did you understand all that? I, I think it's pretty clear. Another quote, the Czech language disappears more and more from the county. 
The Bohemian youngsters know only a few Czech greetings, and none of them speaks the language. Census said that there were 60 Czech speakers left in Republic County. Uh, it said that 55 were still in Ellsworth, where Wilson is, and a total of uh, 615 for the, the whole state. Let's take a look at French. Uh, as you can see from the map, uh, the, the most significant French settlement in the 19th century was up in Cloud County. Uh, and let's take a look at, at the statistics on that. Well, first I'll show you Cloud County. That's what I'm going to do. St. Joseph was the center of that settlement. Uh, Aurora is also involved in that. Uh, you may know the convent in Concordia, the St. Joseph convent. And you, uh, Vince, you mentioned a prisoner of war camp, which has absolutely nothing to do with the French, but that's, that's an interesting story in its own right. Uh, here we have French Canadians uh, who first settled in northern Illinois, then coming out uh, to settle in Cloud County in the 1870s with a focus on the community in St. Joseph. Uh, smaller groups of French-speaking Belgians, Swiss, and directly from France also settled in the county, sort of augmenting uh, this, this French community. Uh, as late as 1948, half of the sermons, now sermons at the Catholic Church, were in French. Uh, keep in mind that the mass would have been conducted in Latin, uh, but the, the homily or the sermon would have, and some of the readings would have been in the vernacular. Uh, and still in the 1950s, Father Bergeron uh, was still preaching in French on occasion. All right. So this, this had a very uh, relatively longer uh, history in the church. Uh, by 1950, even those most partial to the language agreed that very few born after 1930 could actually speak it. The 1950s, couples who had brought up their children so they heard little French at home began using it rather frequently and talking together, probably because deference for the old had again become proper, and they had re resumed its use in dealing with them. So this is kind of a, first the parents stop using French, and then later they try to pick it up again, maybe in a desperate attempt uh, to teach it to their children, okay? Uh, one final little thought, in 1964, a Mrs. Brunel in the hardware store at Aurora was reported to find great pleasure in talking French with her old customers. So out of the 1,700 French at the end of the 19th century, by 100 years later roughly, uh, the census reports 40 speakers. And, and we'll see in a minute what kind of speakers all these very small numbers actually are. And we'll see how desperate this. You asked me if I was a pessimist. I'm not a pessimist, but this is the reality, OK? Back to our crazy quilt. Uh, I just wanted to show you this. This is an 1893 map produced by uh, William Herbert Carruth, the first professor of German at the University of Kansas. And he uses a little bit different color scheme. Uh, the green is Bohemian. Uh, the orange is uh, Swedish. The yellow is German. He doesn't have everybody there, but it's one of the very first attempts in 1893 to document all of these uh, uh, foreign languages in Kansas. Our friends from Mexico. Uh, they come a little bit later. Uh, it's uncertain when the first uh, Mexicans began arriving in Kansas. Uh, but by 1900, they're making an appearance. Uh, they're working on the railroads as rail, uh, rail crews uh, to repair the railroad line. Later, they work in salt mines, uh, sugar beet fields, uh, refineries uh, for sugar beets, uh, for sugar, and uh, eventually in the meatpacking industry. And the, the counties that are highlighted uh, with the red dots, according to Carmen, had uh, 190 or more Mexicans. I don't know why he picked the number 190, but at least you can see that, that they're largely following uh, the rail lines and in the, they're in the population centers like Emporia, uh, Dodge City, even Garden City already by this time. So by 1930, we had uh, a considerable number of Spanish-speaking people from Mexico, 
in the state of Kansas. And that's uh, also reflected in a map like this uh, from more recent uh, vintage that again shows that the heaviest concentration in the southwestern part of the state. Well, let's bring this early phase of uh, the settlement of Kansas by non-English speakers to a, a first close. I, I've got this close and then I've got a later close, okay. Uh, I found this grave marker in the cemetery just outside of Herndon, Kansas. I don't know if you can, can you see the actual inscription? Uh, it's a Hungarian German in Herndon, Kaspar Kaiser, died probably of influenza in 1917. Hier liege ich und warte auf dich, wenn du vorbeigehst, bete für mich. Well, nobody understands what's on that grave marker. And it's pretty poignant. Here I lie waiting for you. When you pass by, pray for me. But nobody in the community knows enough German to understand what's on the grave marker. I had to tell the people I was with, we've got to come over here and pray for Kasper. He's waiting for it, okay? And that, to me, kind of sums up where most of these 19th century immigrant languages are headed. Now, we talked a little bit about some other cases this morning, but uh, that's the situation. Well, why did we lose all of this rich linguistic heritage? Or why are we on the verge, let's say, of losing it? This is my idea, that the Model T Ford is the culprit. Started production in 1908. Uh, 15 million Model Ts were produced over a 20-year period. What did that do to American society? It meant that you were no longer restricted to a few miles from the family farm. Uh, you could get in the car and drive down the muddy dirt road, right? Right, Jim? You ever done that in a Model T? Well, you needed something else. Uh, in the 1920s, the government passed the National Highway Act to develop a series of national highways. They just didn't happen out of thin air. Somebody had to do it, and they did it. And they started building highways, such as everybody's favorite, Route 66. But these were improved roads. They were gravel roads, largely, at the beginning. When did they finally all get paved? These are interesting questions. Route 66 was not fully paved until about 1940. But now, once you had paved roads, and even the you know, county roads were being improved, graded and nice gravel, uh, and everybody was getting their Model T or some other car by then. Well, Hans and Fritz, or whatever their names were, didn't have to stay on the farm. They could drive over to the next county. They could find a girl that wasn't part of their group. And that was the beginning of the end. They, the, once the society became mobile, uh, the rural enclaves, or Sprachinseln, as you were referring to, started to break up. Plus, we have the move toward urbanization. Uh, the Great Plains are the one area where the most population is being lost. Now, I know Garden City in the Southwest, they're going to be a big exception to this, so thank God for them. <laughs> but for the most part, our rural communities are losing people. And which people are they losing? It's the young people. And that leaves older people behind. I, I just want to give you one other. I took Marshall County, Kansas, over a 100-year period, losing 60% of its population. It was uh, close to uh, 25,000 in 1900. In 2010, it was down to 10,000. That's a lot of loss. And if it had 1,200 Germans in 1900, and in 2010, there's only 72 people left that claim to speak German, you can see what's happening, okay? Uh, the, the generations are taking their toll, as Jim pointed out in the three-generation model. Uh, the mobility of the society is taking its toll. The population loss is taking its toll. And to top it all off, and, and this kind of uh, puts it all together, 
the people that are left are getting older and older. Now that's kind of a stupid statement, but what's left behind are elderly people who maybe that 20 or 50 number refers to people 65 or older, which is my guess, that can still speak the language, and we know what's going to happen with time. We've got an older population, a decimated population, and a population, the younger population has moved away. So we're looking at the end of those communities. Uh, Kansas was already teaching the instructional language in its schools by the 1870s was English by and large. There were a few parochial schools that uh, used German or Swedish or what have you, uh, but by and large, the first generation born in this country were being taught in English. Uh, once that happens, uh, you're really beginning to lose the language. Uh, we talked about the anti-foreign bias that cropped up uh, during the World War I period. It was the German group was really hard hit, but if you look at other language groups, we saw the comment about Swedish. Uh, I know this for Norwegian. Jim, have we had a war against Norway? No. Uh, group after group is going through the same anti-foreign situation and uh, losing speakers that way. The churches, most of our foreign language settlements in Kansas were focused on a church as, as their center. Uh, if you're a church and you believe that God speaks German or Swedish or Czech or French and the young people are learning English, are they going to go to church with you? They're going to go to the Methodist church down the road where they can hear the sermon in English. And so one by one, the foreign language churches switch over to English social mobility, etc. Two big exceptions. And this was, one is the Garden City model, you might say, where continuing immigration prevents some of these other factors from taking hold. And as long as that, ha as, as long as you have continuing immigration of fresh speakers into the community, you can maintain that linguistic community, that culture. Uh, but if that stops, it's like turning off the spigot and these other factors will start taking effect. The other exception, get out of America. How do you do that? You could leave, you could go to Canada, or you could say, we're not gonna be part of American society, but we're gonna stay here. Well, who's doing that? The Amish, for instance, or the Hutter, well, the Hutterites are a little bit different case, but let's stick with the Amish. The Old Order Amish, have a very strict lifestyle. Uh, some people call them the plain people. Uh, they still look like they lived in the 19th century. They don't have cars. Uh, in Kansas, they can drive tractors with metal wheels. Uh, in Pennsylvania or Ohio, they have to do the farm work with horses. It's a really neat sight to drive through Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, and see them out in the field with their team of eight horses pulling a plow. It's, it's, that's neat. Uh, but they are in their isolation. They have their own little community. Uh, they maintain worship services in Pennsylvania German. As long as they continue to do that, and the kids don't all leave, they'll keep going. Uh, there's no way you could predict the end of the, uh, or the demise of Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, one of the good things is they have lots of kids. <laughs> they have large families and they keep the generations together. Uh, the Amish, when uh, the older generation is sort of at retirement stage, they build a Grossdadi house in back of the house where the younger family lives. So you've got kids, the middle-aged parents, and the grandparents all living together. And Mervad, you, you were talking about uh, the grandmother's role. Uh, the grandparents will speak German to those kids, all right? So it can work. Social isolation like the Amish don't have electricity because that would bring the evils of the outside world in uh, or continued migration. That's my 
or you make your grandchildren speak German, uh, Arabic. That would be the other solution. Okay. Uh, gosh, when was I supposed to stop? Did you hear what he just said? I'll, I'll go through this a little bit. Uh, these are my three models uh, that I've just talked about. Uh, typically, we have this total assimilation. We have partial accommodation. And I put the Latinos in here because, as you said, they, they kind of interact with the American culture, but they still maintain their Spanish uh, language. There could be a very rapid assimilation. Uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the Vietnamese or the uh, Mennonites from Mexico. Uh, they're entering American society with all this mobility and, and change, and unless they can keep more people coming, I don't know how long they can, they can hang on. Uh, the religious aspect is very important. If, if the uh, churches maintain a language other than English as the language in which God must be worshipped, and the community accepts that, that can be a very strong factor in keeping the language intact. But like I said before, uh, typically the younger people, as they learn English, to prevent them from leaving the church, the community adapts. Okay. Uh, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, finally came to me through the dissertation of Scott Seeger up in uh, Marshall County with the Low German group was that you spoke the immigrant language with the barnyard animals. We, we don't think of that so much, but what else would you speak to them? You couldn't speak English to them. They didn't understand that. So you spoke your, your dialect. Uh, but again, that, that's all succumbing with time. Now, here's a nice model. It's based on a Mennonite group in McPherson County in the community of Hoffnungsau, the Meadow of Hope, all right? Uh, persons born prior to 1950 grew up in a non-English environment, by and large. Uh, a dialect or non-standard variety was used at home, in school and church. Actually, I should say in church school and in church, the literary variety was used. Uh, and Naved uh, talked about the, uh, the Quran as, as being this liturgical variety of Arabic that, that uh, all the groups uh, employed. Uh, by the last third of the 20th century, this group was still able to speak their language when they got together with family and friends. And luckily, uh, during the, the last 30 years of the 20th century, we were able to make a lot of recordings among these people, uh, at least for the German group. Uh, those who were born after 1950, prior to 1930, uh, they still had a mostly non-English home life. Uh, they had some training usually in a Bible school or a Sunday school, uh, for the use of the non-English language in church. But the critical difference with this group is that they started speaking English to their children. All right? So this is a group born right around World War I. When they started having children, let's say in the 1930s and, and later, uh, that next generation is losing the language, basically. The next 15-year uh, period, uh, some immigrant language still being used in the home. English is starting to predominate. They typically had no formal training in the language. They can only remember it as children in church. Uh, they may have a passive knowledge of the language. I've encountered numerous people like this, but they cannot speak any more than a few words. Uh, this next group is, is pretty passive uh, in the sense that they, they really never learned the language. Uh, they may have taken it later, uh, the, the, the standard language in school as a foreign language, but they really don't have uh, much experience in the language. And then, then there's this later group, and this is a very interesting group. Uh, they, don't, they never spoke it, they don't understand it, but they love it. <laughs> Uh, and they, they want to celebrate their heritage. And, and they're very involved in creating some of these uh, heritage groups. 
and this is where we're largely at for, for the bulk of the languages. All around Kansas, there's ethnic celebrations. Uh, the Germans have several different things. Uh, Bethel College has its annual fall festival where they have a low German play by the Mennonites. And the Schweitzer Mennonites from uh, Mound Ridge, they get up and they tell some jokes. Uh, you can always tell how many people laugh uh, at the end of a joke, uh, how the language situation is going. And I, I hate to have to say this here, but they are largely people from senior citizen communities that get up and do these things. All right. Um, now, Scott Seeger, the, the student I mentioned, did his dissertation on the Low German group in Marshall and Washington counties, and they got so excited uh, by his investigation of their dying dialect that they created a Low German Heritage Society. But that's, again, sort of a last gasp. Uh, as the last speakers are fading from the scene, they have a heritage society. They were going to teach Low German, even to children, but it evolved into just a nice get-together for the elderly who could still speak the dialect, which is wonderful. I, I, I love it, but it's not going to keep the language uh, going. Uh, there's still uh, Volga German wedding reenactments out in, in Ellis County. The Bukovina Germans have their Oktoberfest, which they called a genuine Oktoberfest, as opposed to the non-genuine Oktoberfest in Hayes. <laughs> but they're both in Hayes, actually, right? Uh, the Swedish uh, festival that I mentioned, and the Czech festival in Wilson. I, it does say the Czech capital of Kansas on the sign. Okay. Well, that brings me to the end, or to the future, I guess I should say. And we've talked about this today. Uh, these are the situations. Uh, maintenance through continued immigration or societal isolation. Uh, or we would have to have a, some societal acceptance of multilingualism. I don't know if that's going to happen. I, uh, somebody was asking about uh, just one language for the whole world. I, I doubt if that's going to happen. Otherwise, the future holds the assimilation to English. Or, and this is what I believe, I think we'll have surprises down the road. I, as I've already said, I never thought uh, 30 years ago that I would be witnessing a fresh new immigration and settlement in Kansas of speakers of a German dialect. But it is happening before our eyes in southwestern Kansas with these Mennonites uh, from Chihuahua that speak Plautich. Uh, I can't say where that next immigrant group might come from, but we know that there's, they're coming from all over the world to portions of Kansas, and the future is still bright. It's not going to be the old 19th century groups, but it'll be new groups that we don't even imagine right now. And on that happy note, I think I will say thank you very much, and uh, keep speaking. <laughs>
is important to their way of life, to their religion, to their faith, uh, it, will, it will stay. Uh, all you have to do is look at some of these other groups that I mentioned, like the Amish and the Hutterites, uh, some of the conservative Mennonite groups. Uh, they, as long as they believe that Plautdeutsch, let's say, is what has to be the focus of their religious life and they stay faithful members of that church, then they can last, they can continue. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this, that I, I was in Copeland, Kansas and spent two hours at a worship service, three different preachers, all Plautdeutsch. Uh, they did sing hymns in standard German. And at the very end, uh, the last hymn was in English, which kind of made me wonder, well, where is this all headed? But, but for the moment, they have an intact community with, with their language. Yeah, I believe, firmly believe that uh, in Kansas at least, and I, I suspect this is true in other places in the United States, that, that the uh, religious factor is extremely important in the group's coherence, their sticking together. I, I, don't, I don't know about the secularization of the folks that are still out on the farms, though. I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah. Sure. Have you ever heard the saying, uh, how are you going to keep them down on the farm once they've seen Paris? Is, is that, that's not a, <laughs> that's not a good one. Okay. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, how far can you get in a, in a horse and wagon in one day? Not very far, 10 miles? I don't, you know, county, counties were developed uh, so that the county seat was no more than, let's say, 10 miles from any place in the county. And that's all the farther people could get. As soon as you have a car, even if it's a Model T, and you have a decent road, well, guess what? You're, you're not restricted to your environs, your, your farm and, and the neighboring farms, okay? And so the people started moving. They became, society became much more mobile. Uh, you could go to a dance in two counties over and still get home. Uh, and you meet girls and boys from other groups. And, you know, if everybody married uh, somebody in their own ethnic group that spoke the language, well, they would keep speaking the language probably. That, that would be one way of thinking of it. But... Uh, it may sound a little far-fetched, but I, I think it's true. <laughs> yes, sir? I'm a little bit curious as to why English was the language that was chosen to be taught in schools going back to the 1870s oh, wow. in Kansas, as opposed to you know, some other language. I guess it's because they just thought that was the thing to do. I, I don't know why. Uh, I mean, English uh, certainly was never uh, given any official status in the United States, and still for the whole nation, it still hasn't uh, received any official status, but it just kind of evolved as the national language. There's a big myth out there. Have you guys heard that one about uh, German almost became the national language? But that's, that's hogwash. Uh, it, was, it was based on a, a story about uh, some legislation uh, to have federal statutes printed in German, I think in Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. And, the, and, and that became this myth that by one vote, uh, uh, German would have been the national language, but there was never any move like that. But you see that in a lot of states. Wisconsin, the, one of the most German states, had legislation by the 1880s that instruction had to be in English. Might have been an early attempt to thwart the spread of other languages, but I, I don't I don't know the reason to be honest with you. I don't know if there was some anti there was certainly the anti foreign sentiment in the 1850s. Yeah, I got for you. Uh, <laughs> the Irish was shown on there as being the number two yeah. uh, immigrant group in the state of Kansas. Did they speak English or did yes. they speak Gaelic or? As, uh, to my knowledge, they spoke English. 
Uh, that, that shows up in the Civil War as well. The, uh, the Union Army consisted primarily of uh, Irish and Germans. So was Gaelic actually a dialect, a language? No, no, Gaelic has its own language. language. But I've, uh, to be honest with you, I've never heard of anyone claiming there, was, there were Gaelic speakers in Kansas. Now, there were Welsh speakers, as you saw on that one map. But I've never encountered Gaelic as such, or Erse, however you want to couch the Celtic language from Ireland. I don't know if anybody's, any other information on that? No. So that's another stumper. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Union Army was made up of Irish and who else? Germans. Uh, there have been people who there were, for instance, the uh, uh, the Union Army. There were about two million that served in the Union Army, and about two thirds of that are claimed to be either Irish ancestry or German ancestry. Two thirds. So that's a lot. Uh, there's some studies that that show the Germans making up close to 700, 750,000. And uh, that's, a, that's a story that nobody s says out loud. <laughs> but it, it's, it was a largely an immigrant force uh, fighting the Southerners who viewed themselves as the, excuse me, Ed, the Native Americans, preserving whatever they were preserving, slavery. That was true in the Frontier Army. Also, as you know, when you went to a place like Fort Larmouth or Fort Leavenworth, um, those guys out there with Cusser were on the parade ground learning military drill in, uh, in German. Well, well, you know, here you are, an immigrant. You, you go to the military and uh, you have a, some kind of an existence, not necessarily a secure one if, if they're going to get uh, killed, but... Uh, at least it was a bed, even if you shared it with the other guys. <laughs> I love Fort Larned, by the way. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I, while I appreciate the, the, the languages you're discussing are largely related to immigration and what's coming on and how the, the culture has changed, um, but I'm curious how, how you feel um, Deaf culture fits into that, and American Sign Language. While and I, I appreciate that there's a, a difference on some to some degree because it's just it's, it's not a spoken language. But I'm curious right. how you feel that fits in because it's certainly a, a part of the culture around here. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, and you're, it's certainly not part of this uh, immigrant situation. It is, a, it is a language in its own right. It has, it has a culture, certainly. It has, there's even literature uh, in sign language. Uh, we talked about this this afternoon. It also is, is different in that it, it's not uh, something that's going to be handed down from generation to generation. It has to be learned anew by each group of people that are, are faced with that uh, issue of, of not being able to uh, hear or speak. Uh, and uh, if, uh, I, boy, I, I, that, that's a stumper too. I don't, I don't know that it really fits into this kind of context. I, you know, I've been thinking in terms of settlements, and I don't know that a, a group of sign, signers will go out and settle in, let's say, McPherson County and establish a, a community of signers. It could be possible. And in that case, they, then we would have to see what happens. But, but they can't continue unless they get new immigration, and then we're in that, that Garden City model. So I, I could see it fitting in in that sense. Uh, it would have to be the uh, continued stream of, of new signers as, quote, immigrants to the community, and then it, then it would be basically in the same situation. But, but they can't give that up. <laughs> Uh, uh, there are a lot of complications because there's no offspring, okay? Uh, here we're talking about subsequent generations not maintaining the language of the parents and grandparents, and here you're going to have to have new, new signers being trained to join a community from outside of the community. See what I mean? So it's, it's a different situation, but it, there are similarities because it's, and means of communication, sure. 
That's an interesting, thank you for bringing it up, actually. <laughs> we did talk about it this afternoon, though. Yeah. Any more stumpers? <laughs> well, then, uh, auf Wiedersehen. Gute Nacht. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thanks very much.